Hi, good morning. Thank you, Rebecca. I really appreciate it. Uh, my name is David Pagos. I'm a special assistant with the California Department of Food and Agriculture. I'm pitch hitting for uh, Mr. Nick Condos this morning, our director of our plant health division. He got a scheduling conflict, and so uh, you get the, the B team today with the European Grapevine Mod presentation. However, I, I was boots on the ground and, and very familiar with this program, so I should be able to uh, um, relay all the information on the program. So I'm going to go through and, and start talking about the European Grapevine Moth Eradication Program uh, and the formula for success of the eradication pro project here in California. So I'm going to provide a little background about uh, our pest prevention system here. And uh, hold on one sec. I'm um, having a bit of a difficulty one second. All right, sorry about that. I'm a little uh, technically challenged, so uh, <laughs> uh, thank you, Amber, for your help. So. Here at the California Department of Food and Agriculture, our mission here is to protect ornamental plants and native habitat as well as agricultural crops from harm caused by invasive species. So pretty much we're here to protect our natural resources and agriculture here in California. Our state uh, statutory authority and legislative intent health and pest prevention services mission is legislated mandated by our food and agricultural code here in California to protect ornamental and native plants as well as agricultural crops that may be harmed by invasive species. The legislature enacted mandates also recognized that the, the, the pest prevention system is uniquely positioned to protect California's urban and natural environments as well as its agriculture. You can see a, a plethora of different invasive species that impact us here in, in California. So how does a fully functioning and ro robust uh, pest prevention system benefit other agencies? So we, we uh, maintain the authority and the expertise on pest prevention systems. However, partnering with other agencies, for example, on some hydrilla eradication projects in our, our Great Delta that we have here in California, we have other partners such as boating and waterways, who have interest in clearing the waterways and potentially funding as well through DWR, Department of Water Resources. And so that's kind of how we all benefit from this because we have the authority to move forward and eradicate boating and waterways as the interest in, to support those efforts and Department of Water Resources has the, the resources of the funding to make the project happen. And so it's just one example of, of some of the collaboration here in California on our pest prevention system. And again, I'm just going to go over the pest prevention system very generally and then to start um, zeroing in on the European grapevine moth specifically. So one of the uh, big important factors here, because we have 38 million folks here in California, is our partners and trying to get uh, from the county, state, and federal level. Uh, on our federal side, we partner with the United States Department of Agriculture, of course, and uh, APHIS typically, uh, but we also work with many other other uh, foreign um, FSA and, and uh, ag resource, uh, research services as well as others. Uh, as, um, Customs and Border Protection is another partner of ours that uh, works on the international ports of entry and helping us keep things out in the first place, and I'll go over that in a second, and then the U.S. Forest Service uh, due to things like shot hole bore that we have here, uh, gold spotted oak bore, uh, sudden oak dead, things that would affect our urban and uh, um, rural forests, but also our, our landscapes um, within urban areas. And then, of course, the California Department of Food and Agriculture, we focus on interstate and local activities and the agricultural interest groups uh, contribute to the pest prevention system by funding activities such as watercraft inspections at our border stations and uh, detection surveys for uh, aquatic weeds like hydrilla like I kind of uh, alluded to earlier. And then agricultural interest groups, these primary focus on pests of 
a specific concern to a commodity group, for example, European grapevine moth, right? It impacted uh, wine grape, uh, table grape, and, and raisin production. And so all those commodity groups all joined together to, to help us uh, with this effort. Another example would be like the Asian citrus psyllid and Wong Long being where the Asian the, the um, citrus industry has stepped up to help us on that one. And then the county agricultural commissioners here in California, all the counties have an agricultural commissioner and so they are invaluable to us at the, the state level for the California Department of Food and Agriculture and at the federal level because they are really uh, got the local focus and can really, uh, how, how to, you know, with California being so diverse from the north of the state to the south of the state, uh, there's different um, interest groups throughout the state and, and so the agricultural commissions are really that local uh, voice and uh, also help us. We contract with them on a number of uh, trapping and, and uh, um, eradication or control activities. And I'm just going to highlight uh, one entity here in California, the California Environmental Protection Agency. We work with a couple of, of these entities, the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment, and these are toxicologists that help us uh, with um, uh, questions from public if we have to spray chemicals in folks' backyards. Uh, they help us uh, develop Q&As and, and different uh, um, informational pieces to provide to the residents or, or industry, as well as being a, a critical uh, voice at public meetings, and I'll kind of go over the public meetings in a little bit later, but um, when we do a project, we notify everyone from the, the Congress, the, our state legislators, our state senate, and our state assembly, as well as our county agricultural, or excuse me, our county supervisors, uh, city managers, as well as like a, a um, county superintendent of public education, those type of folks, and we notify them uh, of the find in the area. And then we hold a public meeting where we have partners such as AWEHA, uh, which is the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment, which are toxicologists to answer individual questions, or Department of Pesticide Regulation to ask about the, the formulation of, of chemicals and how they got uh, authorized for use in California. Then we also have our staff there uh, to, to address individual concerns or scheduling, uh, you know, trying to figure out when we can get access to their backyards, things of that nature. And uh, we also have the county uh, agricultural commissioner's office uh, represented as well. So these two entities, the WEHA and DPR, is the, again, Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment and the Department of Pesticide Regulations, helps us to reduce our, our pesticide use and so it's on best practices. They also, uh, as I alluded to, um, provide questions and answers for us uh, for uh, individual, so it's not coming from us, but it's coming from the experts, right? And I think that's a key component to our outreach. And then the public meetings, uh, so after notifying all the elected officials, we then notify all the homeowners in the treatment area of a pending public meeting. We also provide a lot of information within the packet of information that they receive, as well as an 800 number, so if folks have any questions, they can always contact us. So. This entity is pretty important to us here in California, and we partner with them pretty often. So some of the elements of the pest prevention system, uh, and we'll, we'll go through some of these as, as they deal with the European grapevine moth, uh, the ex exclusion or quarantine activities. Uh, these are external and internal exclusion activities designed to prevent the artificial movement of invasive species and respond to a timely manner to contain the spread of a newly uh, detected um, test. And all of these components were actually utilized in the European Grapevine Moth program. And we'll kind of go over uh, each of these and how they tie into the European Grapevine Moth. The exclusion activities I'll go through here in a moment on the next couple slides. Detection, so we have a network as all, all states do, detect, uh, uh, early detection, what I call pest detectives out there uh, looking for pests with our traps on a grid pattern that's always kind of a, a surveillance activities and then once we find something of course we increase our trapping density. Uh, eradication, uh, timely and effective eradication uh, activities to eliminate the new pest in, uh, infestation and so that's what we undertook with the European grapevine moth. And then control, control and contain systems for plant pests that uh, have been widely established. And so we actually utilize this as well as the European grapevine moth by using twist ties or mating disruption. Uh, in between treatments. 
uh, identification is the accurate and timely pest identification. We can't move forward with a project unless we know exactly what the pest is so that we can find solutions that would target that pest and, and mitigate any impacts on our local environment. Public outreach, that's really my specialty, is the outreach programs to enlist public support of pest prevention systems through enhanced public awareness and education. And so we um, uh, do a, a number of, of uh, different public outreach uh, in addition to what I mentioned on the um, earlier about the public meetings. We also have presences throughout the state partnering with other agencies to educate folks about how we are out there preventing and protecting our agriculture and, and natural resources. I'm going to sneeze. Excuse me. Um, so and then the, finally, the scientific support, uh, research, information technology, pest risk analysis systems to ensure that the, the pest prevention program is relevant, uh, scientifically based, and continuously improved. And so uh, we work with, um, we create a, a, a technical working group, a TWIG, uh, with the help of the feds and uh, the state uh, to create kind of a path forward and help guide the program so that we're using the principles of IPM on all our programs. So uh, just quickly on our exclusion activities, uh, California has got some unique uh, topography and that kind of provides our natural protections here in California. So we have our Sierra Nevada mountains and the Mojave Desert on the east side and then the Pacific Ocean on the west side that helps protect us naturally. Uh, pests are, are not inclined to fly over the Pacific Ocean or the mountains or nor the desert for that matter. And so those are kind of a, a built-in natural protection. And then we augment that by our exclusion border stations. So we have interior border stations throughout the state here in California that monitor incoming traffic and uh, really you know, I, I often have to educate a, a lot of folks about, about this program because folks uh, that have California plates often say, oh, they're not doing anything, they're just waving us through. But they're really targeting is, is uh, vehicles from states that uh, may harbor invasive species, the Asian longhorn beetle or um, emerald ash borer, things of that nature that we don't want here in California. And that would prosper, just like you know, a lot of folks love to live here in California. The bugs get a, a foothold here, and they're going to take off and proliferate. And so that's what we're trying to avoid: is the establishment of these pests. So you know, everyone agrees on keeping them out in the first place. Once they get here, and how we deal with it, well, that's a, a, a totally different situation. But so this uh, kind of uh, list all our border stations coming into California, and so we're really targeting is again you know vehicles coming from certain states that may harbor invasive species that don't want here, but also nursery stock, commercial shipments, uh, moving vehicles uh, that that might be uh, moving residents from one location into California, and then um, pods. Pods has been a kind of a, a, a new emerging issue for us where um, pods are these uh, temporary storage um, boxes that uh, a truck will come dump off. Um, you've got a couple weeks to kind of load it up, and then whenever you're ready, they'll come back, pick it up, and either put it in storage or deliver it for, for you somewhere. Problem with those are that sometimes they are left in back east somewhere, and per, perhaps in a gypsy moth area. And so the gypsy moth, as as many folks on this call are well aware, would lay their eggs on the substrates of the the um, pod surface, unbeknownst to the homeowner nor the the transporter of the pods. And then say they're moving to California, so then those pods come through our inspection points, these border stations that I enumerated here. And then we thoroughly inspect those, and we found a number of, of rejectionable items on, on those pods. And so those have been uh, of concern to us and a kind of emerging issue for us, and so we'll continue to work with the company uh, to um, try to get clean pods coming into California. And then our other partners, as I alluded to earlier, are our federal partners at Customs and Border Protection. So we, we uh, partner with them extensively. And so we have several um, international ports of entry that, as every, you know, folks are aware on the call, that with more trade and travel, it's only going to increase invasive species impacts to our state. And so we have the San Ysidro uh, land port uh, um, and 
border crossing in, by San Ysidro, by the Mexican border. And so that is, the, from my understanding, the busiest border crossing in the world. And so you can imagine what is, is coming through that port, right? We try to do the most efficient job as possible, but with so many uh, individuals coming through, it's impossible to get everything. So we, we try to target and, and partner with them to do different outreach activities. For example, like Mother's Day, we'll target flowers coming, coming across the border, or um, we constantly uh, are, are on the lookout for nursery stock, that's specifically uh, citrus nursery stock coming across the border so that it's not harboring uh, Asian citrus psyllid uh, or an infected tree, something that may be infected with Hong Long being something along those lines. Uh, the San Francisco International Airport and the Los Angeles International uh, Airport are, are obvious points of entry from international uh, flights coming from the Pacific Rim, or it could be coming from other locations as well. It could be coming from Europe also. But, uh, you know, typically in California, we're in the dubious position of getting some of the first pests in the nation. And so it's always uh, important for us to, again, try to exclude uh, those pests from entering California in the first place. And then uh, finally, our dog team. So we have dog teams that uh, work um, in our uh, FedEx, uh, UPS, uh, United States Postal Service, looking for unmarked parcels of, of um, uh, agricultural products that are coming through. And so we've had many, many successful detections. And the dog teams are wonderful. I, I can't uh, talk enough about them. Uh, they're all rescue dogs as well, so they tell a great story. And uh, they're just invaluable to our efforts of detecting some of these uh, invasive species that are coming through uh, parcels. And again, with more trade and travel, it's, it's uh, more important than ever that we're uh, vigilant on, on this pathway for invasive species. And we found many, many uh, different invasive species from Asian citrus psyllid to home nursery stock, to you know, you name it, we, we've come through the, the mail. And so, again, the dog teams are invaluable. And, and just um, briefly going back to the international ports of entry, we also work with the beagles at those ports of entry. And um, just on a side note, we're also working on the don't pack a pest effort um, with signage at, at all three of these international ports of entry. And we're partnering with uh, Florida, Texas, Hawaii, and, and we uh, look to expand that program elsewhere. So uh, why are more pests becoming established in California? Uh, according to a recent um, study that, you know, from about 10 year, about 20 year period, annual rate of detection of established populations of invertebrates uh, increased uh, to nine per year, um, about a 50% increase over the last 20 years. And again, how do, what do we attribute this to? More trade and travel, right? We have more uh, cargo boxes coming in, more human beings traveling, as well as more parcels uh, into our, our mail facilities. Approximately 44% of the non-native invertebrates likely arrived from populations established elsewhere in North America. The rest came from foreign countries through international ports or established. Uh, the rate of establishment has been unchanged by Customs and Border, after Customs and Border Protection took over exclusion responsibilities from USDA. And then the University of California, our, our Center for Invasive Species Research, estimates that uh, the invasive species cost to California is over $6 billion per year. Pests are having a greater impact here in California. Negative impacts of invasive species in California is greater now than it was in the past because of the warmer climate. It has increased the value of urban and natural forests that sequester carbon, uh, clean air, and, and save energy. Just, just kind of alluded to earlier, just like a lot of folks like to come here and live in California, you can imagine if some of these pests get out here in California with the abundant sunshine and pretty nice weather year round. Except this year we've had a, a lot of rain and, and actually flooding this year, but typically it's, it's pretty nice out and, and so they, they can just proliferate and, and take off here in California. Uh, the transition to permanent and high value crops like almonds, walnuts, pistachios, wine grapes, citrus, uh, due to co consumer demand, reduce pest management options like pest free periods or crop rotation that are available for annual crops and the increase uh, in the organic food production here in California is about 8% of our production, but it's growing to about 9 or 10% due to consumer demand. Um, and again, we have about a $54 billion industry here, com uh, commodity industry, but then if you extrapolate that from all the seed salesmen, insurance salesmen, those type, types of things, it's about a $70, $80 billion a year operation. 
And so the organic food movement is a growing segment of that. However, the, in, the, the difficulty there is that there's fewer cost-effective pest management options uh, in our tool chest to, to, um, because of the increasing number of crops. And, and, and so that's an ongoing issue of trying to find efficacious uh, materials that will uh, help us in our, our fight against invasive species. So uh, then this is the last slide on the pest, and I'll get into more detail on the European Grapevine Moth Program. Um, and the, the increase in consumption of fresh, locally grown fruits and vegetables means a, a proportionally larger percentage of public's diet is susceptible invasive species damage. Uh, up to 60% of residents in areas infested with the Asian citrus psyllid and Hong Long bean have at least one citrus tree. Uh, and so that, because we have to do visual surveys throughout the state, and so we are able to determine that about 60, almost 70% of, of properties have some type of citrus on them. And so that's why we're so concerned with it. Asians are concerned. We have a $2 billion commercial industry here, but again, as you can look at these numbers with 38 million folks, about 60, 70% of them, I, I have a lemon tree that is just proliferating, just producing a ton of, of delicious lemons, and as, as well as many other individuals. And then the public increasing, uh, increasingly objects to reactive responses to invasive species introduction, increasingly demands more preventative-based solutions, and so that's why we're trying to focus on the exclusion activities, do more education and outreach with our Don't Pack a Pest efforts. Um, we also have a Buy It Where You Burn It campaign here on, uh, to target the movement of firewood as a pathway for, we have a couple shot hole bores here in Southern California, the Pulitzer shot hole bore and the Kurushimo shot hole bore as well as, the, the, you know, like I alluded to earlier, the sudden oak death, uh, gold spotted oak borer, those type of uh, pests that can be moved on, on firewood. And so again, we're trying to educate the traveling public and, and residents here in California what they can do to help uh, prevent the, the use of chemicals within our environment and, and lower those, those amounts. And, and so trying to educate folks about of not bringing things back with them when they travel, not mailing things into their family members here, uh, have have um, hopefully increased our our uh, uh, commitment and and compliance with the general public about not bringing things in. And then California's increasingly important role in feeding the world and economic benefit to the state means that invasive species damage will will be amplified as more people rely on California's agriculture and uh, it's a source of food and economic well-being. So California produces about 50% of the fruits, nuts, and vegetables for the United States of America, but then we also export ridiculous amounts of, of produce throughout the world. And, but for, for America, it's really a strategic resource that we have to protect at all costs so we're not dependent on other countries for our food production. And those uh, yields are only going to need to increase in the future. And so uh, you know, making sure invasive species stay out is of, of greater and greater concern. Okay, so we're going to talk about the European grapevine moth. I got a short video here. This is Gray Clark with the uh, um, uh, um, uh, Napa County, and Napa County, for those that aren't from California, is our uh, high-value wine production area. And so he's going to tell. This is an older video, but it really shows. And then I'll get into a lot of our activities. Really shows uh, the uh, breadth of the infestations. These are after some treatments, but they'll show some shots of the European grapevine moth. I was actually at these sites when we were filming them, and it was just amazing to see the moth, and then to see the commitment from the industry and uh, the local community to to really push back on the European grapevine moth. And again, it was obviously a successful program. See if this works. Knock on wood. Uh, ah, okay, good. Much better than last year. Very nice fruit. So when we were out here last July,
two, three, four larvae in every cluster. So as you look out here, you have 11 acre vineyards with 12 clusters or more. Um, that was a maggot infested vineyard. And so when we came out in April of this year to see how many moths had emerged, uh, moths were everywhere. It, it was beyond anything that I had ever seen and anything that uh, any growers in this area had ever seen. It, it, it was just uh, mind-numbing to see the pest population that we were looking to deal with for this coming year. Now we've come out with checking to see where we are. Are, are there any moths? Can we find a little piece out of here? Uh, and we send all these applications of, uh, of insecticides, use the mating disruption, some monitoring to see. He said bunch rot is, bunch rot is, is almost uh, impossible to find. Some of this other damage is sunburn when it got uh, too hot a couple weeks ago. Uh, but, you know, this is a, a completely different uh, situation than it was last year. Last year, there was no problem with this year. This year, a very hard commodity, uh, a great crop of Chardonnay. What I was going to do was to take a look at some of these clusters that look like they have bunch rot and see if there's Lobesia. Uh, where there's bunch rot, there's Lobesia. But what I see here is uh, a little bit of bunch rot. I don't see any webbing uh, from the larva. I don't see any larva. Uh, I don't see any you know, grass, insect droppings. I don't see cat skin. I don't see pupa. Uh, I don't see anything here that would lead me to believe uh, there's any European grapevine moth here. And that's been consistent uh, all year here. And because he was so successful in accomplishing what would appear to be eradicating this moth in his vineyard, uh, the approaches that he used, the tools, the teamwork, everything that came into this really should be considered the model for addressing European grapevine moth when it's found. In order to ensure that this grower continues to have a bountiful harvest, not just this year, but years into the future, that every grower needs to take the same measures that he's taken to successfully combat European grapevine moth. It's not terribly complicated, but there are some key things that he did and that growers can do. And a lot of this centers around the mating disruption, properly applying material. If the growers in this community and elsewhere where you're being raised by moms follow these protocols, they're going to have this grower has, this project has, and uh, continue farming. So uh, I apologize that the, the the sound on that was a little low, but that I just wanted to really show the videos of the um, finds early on, and you can see the the moss buzzing around, it was uh, quite the sight, and uh, we didn't really understand what was going on initially. So in October of, 20, uh, of 2009, the European grapevine moth was first detected in Napa County, and that's Gray Clark's district, or, uh, county there. Uh, the detection represented the first time the European grapevine moth was found in North America, and European grapevine moth proved itself to be a destructive pest for grapes in Europe and other countries, and so we were trying to learn from them Pretty much a European grapevine moth uh, um, feeds primarily uh, on the grapevine flowers and hollows out the grape um, uh, berries and then leaving only the skin and seeds and that's where the petritus comes in, the fungus, and uh, causes problems for, for production. A, uh, a compre comprehensive eradication program was implemented through a cooperative program through the United States Department of Agriculture, the California Department of Food and Agriculture, local agricultural uh, commissioners, local elected officials, industry, uh, stakeholders, and the public. And uh, so then we also extended quarantines throughout the California for impacted counties. Uh, but one thing I wanted to point out, though, is uh, that in 2010, in our first full year of trapping, there were over 100,000, 100,959 to be precise, uh, in our first full year of trapping. 
and the vast majority of those were detected in Napa County. Over 100,831 of the European grapevine moth were detected in 2010. So we're looking at those numbers going, oh my goodness, what's going on here, right? But but after the industry got engaged and we uh, were, were working on time, time treatments as well as the mating disruption, as a result of the cooperative program in 2012, only 77 European grapevine moths were detected in Napa County, and that's a 99% reduction in European grapevine moth detection um, since 2010. And so, again, you know, I just wanted to point out that the, the full breadth of this uh, invasive species and, and the impacts to our, because it was commodity specific as well, really, uh, I think, helped us on this project. So as I alluded to, the European grapevine moth is not native to, to California, and, and again, it's really the, the botrytis that is the main concern for our production. It, uh, a couple of our of our uh, vineyards were heavily impacted, and, um, and and were forced to pretty much 11 acre field or a vineyard, and um, unfortunately, that was a lost vineyard in in 29. Eight, uh, 2009, they weren't able to uh, garner any uh, fruit from that from that uh, vineyard. Uh, finding it is, uh, we are lucky to have traps that were effective, and so that was one of the keys uh, we believe to the successful eradication as well was having lures and traps that were uh, successful in finding the European grapevine moth, so that we could uh, expand from a, a, a ten counties altogether. Uh, were impacted um, down to pretty much as Napa and a little bit of Sonoma County for the last couple of years, just using uh, twist ties and mating disruption uh, until uh, we were detection free for a couple of years. Uh, so the keys to successful eradication are the development of the cooperative plan, uh, motivated and engaged uh, stakeholders. Of course, in the Napa and, and Sonoma County, uh, there's a lot of uh, wine grape production and uh, they were all able to uh, engage and, and come together uh, because they saw the issues with this pest and uh, were just a powerhouse in, in helping make this happen. And then it was a public acceptable management option. So we, uh, for you know, growers would would do you know their their time treat. We're Extension University of California Cooperative Extension, and we have some stellar individuals there that were, were just beyond uh, the call of duty for helping us with this pest. And they developed the time treatments, you know, when, when you know the life cycle of the pest, and figuring out when the perfect time to treat, and then working with grower liaisons in each county, we were able to get all the growers to treat at a, a similar time. And then in between those treatments, we used mating disruption. So um, on the, the industrial side, it was very successful and a lot of cooperation. It was in, every, in everyone's best interest to mobilize, and, and the grower liaisons were invaluable to helping communicate and, and help with the timing of those applications. On the residential side of the equation, um, we, we had a number of residents that were impacted. And um, that's always a difficult situation when, um, you know, when we have to go in and spray chemicals. Uh, fortunately for this pest, because it was such host specific, we had a couple of uh, good tools in our toolbox. One was host removal. We could strip the fruit and, and that would mitigate the life cycle for the European grapevine moth. But then also if folks wanted to keep their their grapes, and a lot of them do. You know, they would be little backyard vineyards or a couple vines that folks go, oh, I use those and, and crush them and make my own little wine. And so there was a lot of those type of individuals as well, as you can imagine, in, in those regions. And so they had the option of maintaining or, or retaining their um, fruit uh, as long as they treated with BT or, you know, uh, organically acceptable solution set. And so with the either fruit removal or the organic treatment option, uh, the public was much more apt to, to uh, be supportive of the program. 
So the European Grapevine Moth, uh, again, it was all about the partnership and really all coming together. It was an amazing effort, and, and I can't compliment the industry uh, for stepping up as much as they did. Uh, so that at the state level, again, we were working with the counties, the cities were all engaged and, and helpful, as well as the state and the federal government were, were all uh, heavily uh, engaged. And then the residential community in, in some of these wine growing regions understand where their local economy is based operative and, and you know of course there's always uh, some individuals that we would work with and kind of triangulate and educate them on why we're doing these activities. But the vast majority of the residents understood the severity of this and, and um, like I alluded to, you know, back in 2009 we had two vineyards that were uh, just pretty much that one vineyard you saw that Greg was at, that was ground zero for us. That vineyard lost, I believe, is about $8 million with an 11, 11 acre field. And then there was another field that also uh, was not able to. They, they actually went to production but and tried to crush, but then the um, botrytis was uh, such an impact on the, the, um, the wine product itself that it, it was not sellable and they had to, uh, the, whole, the whole crop was a loss. Um, and so that really, I think, awakened the industry as well, where they thought, oh, well, we might be able to just crush our way through this, and but no, because of the botrytis, it, it was really affecting the quality of wine, and so um, that, uh, again, really got the attention of the industry. And then other host areas, uh, um, we had some uh, riparian areas that were kind of tricky because we had some wild grapes growing along some, uh, some local creeks and tributaries in the Napa region and so those were really tricky on how we we deal with those and pretty much we had to do uh, fruit stripping in those uh, riparian areas because we couldn't do applications and so we worked with our California Conservation Corps and got up there in ladders and I mean it was just a, a, a an all-out effort to remove any host that uh, that may harbor the invasive species and then again industry you know can't speak enough about how they stepped up and uh, were attending all the, the industry uh, meetings and were really uh, gung-ho on coordinating and making sure that the treatments were going off on a, on a timely basis. Again, working uh, under the direction of the UC Cooperative Extension to kind of dictate when the, the, the prime time to treat would be. And again, all the growers uh, stepped up and saw it in their best interest to do those applications and they did that on their own dollar um, with no no help from the federal government or the state and then used mating disruption in between those treatments. The mating disruption um, they did get some support on that we were able to disseminate some mating disruption but then they also had to purchase some mating disruption on their own. Then our University of California system, our UC system, was just invaluable, again, on the timing of the flight period, trying to figure out the life cycle of the pest. And then the USDA TWIG uh, providing the overall strategy recommendations. And for those that aren't aware, the technical working group, or TWIG, uh, is made up of international experts because, again, European grapevine moth was the first time uh, in the nation, of, unfortunately, hit here in California. And so we really had to uh, lean on the expertise of folks in, in the wine grape growing regions of other countries like Spain and France and, and just to uh, name a couple that were off the top of my head, but it's made up of international experts that really helped us drive the, the overall strategy recommendations. And then those recommendations were adopted by, uh, by the, the federal and state cooperative and local cooperative program as well as, as the growers. So a little background on the European grapevine moth, uh, as I alluded to, is identified as the cause of yield loss in several vineyards in Napa in the fall of 2009. Uh, the European grapevine moth and the associated botrytis infections caused complete host loss of two vineyards uh, and an unacceptable tainting of the wine made from grapes from another vineyard. And so again, that was kind of an uh, eye-opener. It was actually in the Oakville area of Napa County and, and for those that are knowledgeable that is some of the most expensive wine in the world and so uh, that, that region, the Oakville region, and so the, the land and the value of those grapes are extremely high and so again that was a, a huge wake-up call for the industry and they saw the impact to them. And then traps were deployed by the California Department of Food and Agriculture but most of the population had gone into biopause after that first fall of 
2009, and so we only had a handful of moths were captured. And, and then the first bees this um, Petrias had been detected in the United States, these detections were from the Oakville, Napa County region, what I just alluded to, and, and Oakville being a high value area. Delimitation traps were placed in Napa and the other uh, grape production areas in California in the spring of 2010, and then the working group um, with international domestic experts was formed and provided recommendations for survey, treatment, eradication, pretty much following the principles of the IPM and uh, helped us craft a, a program that ultimately was successful. We reached up to 10 counties altogether, but then as I alluded to, we shrunk that down to uh, Napa and Sonoma counties, and then we're able to target those counties. Um, so these are from 2010. The, I wanted to just kind of show the Napa County overview here, and you can see kind of some of the outliers, and so we uh, hypothesis, our hypothesis on those outliers were that they were writing on, um, on uh, grape uh, um, harvest machines and so or, or bins and so those were moving around the Central Valley um, in the Central Valley we have a lot of raisin grape production or table grape production and so you can see kind of the outliers uh, areas there that were impacted and again we attribute a lot of those to the uh, Wayne uh, grape harvest equipment and we identified that as a pathway. Uh, again, industry stepped up and started uh, cleaning their equipment better, making sure that there was no hitchhikers on any of the bins if they're going to move their empty bins down to the Central Valley to say collect table grapes or something like that. And so that was another uh, uh, kind of. Uh, initially, we weren't aware of the the pathway, but then once we became aware of it, uh, the industry was all over it and um, really stepped up to make sure that all the bins were clean, any cleaning, uh, any materials, uh, machines were all, were all um, heavily cleaned. We also went to, to the extreme of doing um, kind of educational seminars for uh, vineyard um, workers. And uh, we would kind of come up to next to taco trucks, pay for a, uh, a little um, advertisement on the taco trucks. And then we would do a, a quick little five minute, you know, this is why it's important. These are the steps that you can take uh, to help us prevent the movement of uh, European grapevine moth. And, and um, you know, the vineyard uh, employees were more than happy to comply because they saw the impacts to their, their livelihood. And so these are just some of the counties that were impacted, the Fresno, M M Mendocino, Merced, Solano, San Joaquin, Santa Clara, they're all wine, wine producing counties. And so uh, these were the wide extent of our activities. We also had a couple other outliers in like Nevada County and, and some of these other little counties, but uh, uh, reduce those down to kind of the Napa, Sonoma area. And then the residents' response, the urban residential, you can see here some of our workers doing fruit removal. And so we had uh, just a plethora of staff uh, throughout the uh, region. And so again, um, these are uh, CCC workers, um, California Conservation Corps on the left with our uh, CDFA employees working hand in hand to do fruit removal. We oversaw the activities with the help of uh, the additional labor force. So the treatments began in late uh, March and early uh, April. Uh, again, the options were 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 huge for this program. The fact that we had fruit removal for for one option or BT applications really made it palatable for homeowners. Homeowners weren't really eligible for mating disruption. That was for the commercial operations. But again, these tools in our toolbox uh, we would attribute to to the successful eradication program. Uh, the fruit removal is preferred treatment option um, of, of by far uh, most of the residents uh, were more than happy to give up their fruit for a couple years in order to protect the overall industry and uh, there's a handful of residents that did uh, want to maintain their their grape production so we just worked with them and made sure that uh, we got treatments off on a timely manner and, um, and again the homeowners were, were gracious and understood uh, the impacts. And then the treatments occurred in Napa and, and Sonoma County to the greatest extent. Uh, on the commercial side, we had some voluntary treatments and all the, again, industry was 
was huge how they stepped up and helped us with this program. We had treatment coordinators in Napa, Sonoma, Fresno, and Mendocino uh, counties, and these individuals were were just invaluable tracking uh, pesticide use um, records to determine who was treating and who wasn't. And if there was folks that weren't treating, we would work as a group to uh, educate them on why it's important that we don't have a reservoir of European grape vine moss somewhere in the Napa Valley. So uh, again, the treatment coordinators, I, I can't thank them enough. Uh, they did an excellent job. The timing of the treatments, again, based on the technical working group recommendations as well as UC Cooperative Extension's analysis of their life cycles, uh, that was invaluable to uh, helping us target the first and second flights of each year. And then the growers follow the UCIPM guidelines for treatment recommendations, and there's a link to that there as well. Again, this was all under the guise of the IPM and uh, working with uh, UC Davis to help us uh, uh, determine what's the most efficacious and efficient uh, material to utilize. Uh, and then quarantine activities, we uh, total quarantine area is about 2,000 square miles, and then the, the, the grapes were the, the ultimate major host of that. Um, and then uh, olives were at one time a, a host. Um, the, we determined protocols for inter, intra and interstate movement uh, within and from the quarantine area because uh, there was issues of moving some folks' grapes out of the uh, quarantine area to be crushed or um, moving into a quarantine area to be crushed. That obviously is not such a big issue, but moving out, we were able to make uh, all determinations on how to, to do that. And then the interstate movement USDA systems approach for grapes for consumption, fresh fruit for other than grapes, and then they, they pr produce some uh, outreach materials and, and education as well. And then the intrastate movement, uh, the California Department of Food and Agriculture had a, a master uh, a, a QC permit, and that was for the um, grapes for wine and raisins. And then we, we provided uh, you know, as much information as possible, not only on our website, but also use the uh, University of California's website, uh, the county's website. I mean, it was a uh, USDA. It was a comprehensive effort. The impacts were uh, financially uh, pretty, uh, pretty large. European grapevine moth, as I alluded to, uh, was the wine table raisin and wild grapes that were kind of the impacted commodities, except for wild grapes, not a commodity. Um, uh, in Napa County, approximately 131 acres in 2009 were affected, and about 179 tons were lost, which equated to loss about uh, fruit value of 500,000, but the wine value was, you can see, 3 million there. And then California's associated cost of the control measures was uh, kind of nominal at this point, and then expanded uh, as we had to do more twist ties and, and um, uh, residential treatments. And then grower treatments were approximately about $12 million, but again, that increased as well. Uh, uh, some more uh, economic impacts that, uh, you know, the regulated commodities included not just grapes, but all stone fruit. Um, you can see the list there is about a $6 billion altogether for those commodities. EGVM is the primary uh, uh, pest of economic importance to grapes, which is the number one agricultural plant commodity grown in California. Dairy is our number one commodity, uh, but the plant commodity is uh, is grapes, and they have about a $4 billion a year value. And then you can see some of the counties there is up to about 10 counties altogether that were impacted. Then we were able to shrink it down to Napa and Sonoma counties, and uh, were able to uh, successfully eradicate the um, pest. So in conclusion, and we, you know, we've got about 10 minutes left, so we can open it up for any questions if there are any, but uh, the industry support was uh, the biggest factor in this, really, that they stepped up, 800-pound gorilla said, this is important to us, uh, we need our, our elected officials to take notice, and they did, and um, was... Uh, that led to the agency cooperation where USDA, our you know, United States Department of Agriculture, our California Department of Food and Agriculture, our county agricultural commissioners, and at the city level, the cities were highly engaged as well, uh, all worked together, as well as, uh, I can't leave out the UC um, University of California system, which was uh, just tremendous asset for this whole program. And, um, you know, I, Again, can't thank enough, and, and also the uh, grower liaisons were, were vitally important to making sure that treatments got off on a regular schedule, and then, you know, following up on individuals that, that lack the treatments.
And then uh, treatments were, uh, as I alluded to earlier, a, another key factor in the uh, successful eradication. We had palatable uh, solution sets for residents where they could either keep their grapes and use an organic treatment option of BT, or uh, they could um, just lose their grapes for a couple years. And, and uh, as I alluded to, the vast majority of individuals uh, opted for fruit removal. Um, and, and, and then at the commercial level, um, they also had mating disruption in between treatments uh, to help um, with the confusion of, of mating and, and ultimately reduce the pest population. And then and uh, uh, it's key because we were able to have a successful trap that, that was able to determine where the pest was. And, and so again, the, the trapping was uh, vital and having these good tools in our toolbox. So that's about it. I've been ch chatting a lot here. So Rebecca, if you want to open it up for, or ask if there's any questions, however you want to handle that, that'd be great. So um, that was a really good presentation. It had a lot of information. It's good to see you guys are kind of coming at it from all different kinds of uh, perspectives and, uh, and methods. So uh, if anybody would like to ask any questions now, um, it would be, I'll be able to read them off and um, David will be able to answer them as they come in. So we have a few people still in the, uh, in attendance. So anybody have any questions about the program they're doing? Let's see. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to add, David, while we're waiting on some questions to, to appear? Um, let me just make sure I hit everything. Uh, um, you know, tools in our toolbox, the pest prevention system, uh, the cooperative nature, the repairing areas was was uh, a kind of a key factor as well. Trying to get in some of those uh, um, tributaries and streams. Uh, the public outreach uh, was key component. Grower liaison, uh, industry call to action was huge. Again, the partnership. Um, yeah, and then the treatments. I think we you know pretty much hit hit on everything is. Again, we just got really lucky with the, the treatment, the trapping, and the cooperative, cooperative nature of the, the program. Yeah, and it, it was, uh, I thought it was good that you did bring up the, the organic industry and how that has um, had to be handled with the, the program and, and, and looked at from a, a little bit of a different perspective since that's becoming a, uh, a much larger section, especially in, in California of the... Uh, overall growing industry, but I mean, a lot of people are looking for organic products, so that can impact the programs you guys are putting out there. Let's see, we do have a question. Yeah, very. <laughs> Annie Simpson, is ta uh, the taco truck advertising is ingenious. Is there any way to measure its effectiveness? Well, in my world of public outreach, I mean, that's always the hardest part, right? When I'm doing like a don't pack a pest uh, campaign or, or whatnot, how do you quantify those and, and uh, you know, tell the folks that are paying for the program that it's effective? I mean, I guess one way for the European grape I'm off to show that it is effective is that we eradicate it, right? All those pieces of the puzzle came together to help us eradicate it, but you know, we you can never tell you know how we didn't do any surveys to follow up on it, but we knew um, based on the uh, kind of um, local behavior of, of of the individuals that work on on the vineyards how they would come together at certain points in the day, and so we just try to take uh, take advantage of those opportunities to engage uh, in language too. These were always in Spanish, and to, to engage the the individuals and and. Uh, implore them to be part of the solution set, right, and that they are key in, in this whole thing because they're the eyes that are out there, and if they see something, they can notify uh, the vineyard manager right away or, or, you know, so they were just in, in really a key component to it and, and can't, you know, um, you know, thank them enough for for all the support. And again, it's just a, a collaborative effort where everyone saw the importance of eradicating this pest. And initially, you know, I got to be honest, when we had a hundred thousand fines, it was kind of scary. People, you know, we didn't know how it was going to play out. But uh, after all the education and outreach, it really um, was uh, a, a 
successful program. Again, to quantify the, the taco truck outreach is, is hard, um, but we feel that it was an important component, and, and if we had to do it again, we, we definitely would. Yeah. Uh, yesterday, Lee Greenwood gave a good talk, to, and in it she discussed the cost of surveys and uh, the, there's limiting factors to them and just that they are a lot more costly than one would expect. So um, Annie had a, a follow-up question. Was this the first incursion of this species or is it like the medfly, a repeat offender? Uh, this is the first time, first time in North America actually uh, from 2009. And so not like uh, the incursions of fruit flies, this was a uh, first in the nation, um, detected it, and then um, ju just jumped on it as quickly as possible uh, after talking to uh, some partners in, in Europe and other grape growing regions to figure out the impact. And then those those um, growers, that the video that I showed, that, that vineyard owner in particular, he was incredible. He raised the flag and, and said, hey, look, this is going to be an issue. I just lost lots of money here. And, and so it was, uh, in, you know, the industry itself was the one that that really uh, you know, got got us all engaged and, and to the table. Yeah, it's it's important to have you know so many different stakeholders so that all the bases are covered. So, um, any additional questions from our remaining attendees? So. So is there anything else on the on the horizon or anything else that you guys are, are actively working on or your primary project? Well, sure. I mean, yeah, there's always a, a lot of activities. Um, uh, it's kind of, I alluded to, my world is the outreach world, and so I, we're working on the Don't Pack a Pest at International Ports of Entry, uh, trying to keep things out, and then we'll, we'll work on Florida and Texas and Hawaii, and we'll expand it to other states, and, and then we'll go offshore as well to get signage up in the Beijing airport, those type of things. Uh, again, try to stop the movement of it. I think the biggest thing for folks on the phone is uh, emerging pest that we have is called the shot hole bore. Uh, in Southern California, similar to the tea shot hole bore in Florida. However, it's just hammering. It started in um, avocados, then went to urban uh, forests, and now it's um, settled in the riparian areas. And it's just been hammering willows and other uh, riparian trees. And these are restoration areas as well. So the state or the feds have already put in lots of money to regenerate these areas, and then this uh, shot hole borer comes through and within several months just devastates it. And then that inc incurs the, like a rundo and, and other invasive species uh, to flourish because there's no none of the ha local habitat. So I just kind of put that on, on folks' radar that the shot hole borer for us is kind of one of these emerging pests where, and it's not tied to a commodity group. So that's, the, you know, avocados was initially impacted agriculture that the trees can push out those pests pretty much uh, you know with the sap and those type of, of um, you know their self defenses the avocado industry is still concerned but not as much as they initially were and then it went into the urban forest and so Orange County and other counties I spent lots of money on surveying their trees and now our our US fish and wildlife folks and and um, California fish and wildlife are are uh, the latest group to be engaged on the shot hole bore because of the devastation in the riparian areas and lack of treatment near the, the surface water and, and those type of uh, conundrums. And so that's kind of an emerging pest where we're trying to deal with that one. There's also like the South American palm weevil that's marching across the border from Southern California. I mean, it's job security, right? There's an <laughs> endless amount of invasive species that could be knocking on our door. Uh, another one is the uh, capra beetle uh, movement on grains that we're concerned about. We have a lot of uh, rice production and other things here. So there's always something on the horizon and uh, makes for an exciting day. Yeah, I actually saw um, Interpol put out a, I guess, a press release or media release of some sort yesterday about a program they had with a bunch of different agencies. And it detailed this operation that they uh, worked over the course of three, re three weeks to seize Thir they had 1,300 seizures of a variety of different products, including uh, wood, all the uh, and um, some other like plant matter and and animals as well. 
And the thing that occurred to me was that, you know, those aren't obviously going to go through any kind of inspections or checks or customs or anything like that. And I could just imagine the amount of uh, insects or diseases or anything else that can hitchhike along with all of those uh, natural products, I guess you could say. So you guys are doing some great yeah, work. It is, it is good to see you guys working, like I said, with all these different groups and agencies and inspection groups to to kind of keep things out. It's a lot cheaper to keep things out than to come in after they've come in. Indeed, indeed. And it's finding the right messenger too, right? It's it's not always CDFA. It's not the state being the mess, best messenger. Sometimes we partner with NGOs to help us uh, communicate with residents. So, you know, that's another key component is who's who's the messenger and, and who's, you know, the recipient of that message needs to make sure that they uh, believe in the messenger, right? And so that's why we always triangulate with these different partnerships uh, to to help spread the word to these different diverse communities here in California. It's so diverse, right? I do statewide issues. So from the North State to the South State to the East to the West, we have so many different microclimates and so many different communities throughout California. It's really a challenge. Uh, and, and so working with our Ag Commissioners and then uh, finding those NGOs or third parties to help uh, with these efforts has, has been um, successful. Yep. All right, well, I suppose on our end over here, we could let people go to lunch. I know you're just getting in for the day, <laughs> being out in California. Yeah. So um, thank you again for giving such a great talk, and uh, I don't think we got, you know, any lesser quality than uh, with your, your being the pitch hitter mm -hmm. here. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I All appreciate right. it. Thanks, Rebecca. Thanks, thanks for everyone on the phone as well. And, and you know, please don't feel free to uh, follow up with me if there's any questions or if we can provide any of the materials or anything like that. We'd love to share. So um, you know, to, we want to make sure other states can uh, you know, learn from us and, and vice versa and just kind of figure out the best management practices. So we always partner. And I'm also working on like a tri-state effort with Florida and, and Hawaii and trying to understand our systems and how we all work together. And so there's a, just a lot of communication and, and collaboration that's happening. So. Yeah. And again, this, uh, this talk and, some, and the other webinars from this week will be available as we are recording them. So if you'd like to share this, if you'd like to share any of the others or view any of the other talks, um, be sure to check them out. And uh, you guys have a great day.